Okay, so the next topic is our e-caniculi. So e-caniculi is something that I'm sure a lot of you guys really know about. It's one of the most well-known common rabbit diseases. However, it's a very frustrating disease that we don't have all the answers for. E. caniculi um, is this infectious organism that used to be thought of as a parasite, but I believe it was in 2010 that it was identified that it's actually a fungal organism. And so a lot of times people will kind of switch back and forth. I know I do myself where sometimes I say it's a parasite, sometimes I say it's a fungus, but in reality this is actually a fungal organism. And those are nice little pictures of it. A nice little diagram of what it looks like. Of course, you'll never actually see it because it's microscopic, but this is what it looks like underneath the microscope. Um, this is a particular microscope, a specialized microscope for seeing the organism itself. And then you can see this little thing right here. That is the organism um, that a pathologist would look underneath the microscope. How it's transmitted is it's transmitted either in the urine or transovarily, so meaning from the mother rabbit to the babies when it's in the uterus. So the mother rabbit, for example, let's say that she doesn't transmit it to her babies in the urine or in the in the uterus. The babies are born, she's living with her babies, she has the disease. How she will transmit it if it wasn't in the uterus is it comes out in her urine. And then if they're exposed to her urine, which inevitably they are, um, they can ingest it and then it gets into their system and becomes a problem. So um, there is a nice little description here of actually like how the whole life cycle process occurs. So they either ingest or inhale the organism. It then actually goes into the cells of the rabbit and transfers to like the really um, target organs, the kidneys and the nervous system are going to be the target organs, the areas where it likes to go. And how it actually causes disease is when the organism gets inside of the cell, it can cause that cell to rupture. And as that cell ruptures, of course that cell is no longer functioning like it should, um, it then goes on to invade other cells and causes other cells to rupture. And then as you get a lot of these cells breaking open, you get a lot of inflammation. And as you get a lot of this inflammation in the tissue, it makes it so those tissues, that particular organ, maybe not as functioning as well as it once was before. And this cycle kind of repeats itself over and over. You can have it happen in a subclinical degree to where it's a small amount, it's not causing the animal any visible signs or symptoms or really being a problem, or it can really be quite a massive infection and problem where we are starting to actually see the signs and symptoms. So um, this slide here is all about the signs that we'll see. The most common sign that we see is no sign. E. caniculi is an extremely, extremely common organism. When we have a rabbit that's diagnosed with it, a lot of times people will ask me, where did my rabbit get this from? How did this occur? And the unfortunate reality is, is it's very widespread in the rabbit population, the pet rabbit population. Now the common signs when we actually do see signs and symptoms from this particular disease, one is it affects the nervous system. And so we can have rabbits that come in to the hospital for hind end weakness, we can have them come in for head tilts, that's one of the more common things you read about um, when in rabbit books or on rabbit forums is rabbits with head tilt having this particular issue. Even seizure activity is something that we'll have rabbits come in for as a sign of this disease. You can see it affecting the, the renal system or the kidneys and it may present in the form of some sort of chronic kidney disease which may be a rabbit's drinking more, urinating more, losing weight, or it could potentially present as a sludge situation. That's something that still is something we have more to learn about. And then it can also present with changes to the eyes. So rabbits that have cataracts is something that we'll often see as a cause for or a sign from E. caniculi. And you can even have the lens kind of rupturing in the eye. 
So a few pictures to go over uh, to represent our equiniculi signs, a rabbit with a head tilt. This rabbit up here, you can see the eye, how the normal black portion of the eye, that pupil should be nice and black. His is white because he actually has a cataract. And then the rabbit at the bottom with hind end paresis. He's not able to use those hind limbs as he once was. A few more pictures. This rabbit has a couple signs. He not only has cataracts as an eye, but he also has um, the head tilt issue. This rabbit over here, this is actually a ruptured lens, uh, which is represented by a little bit of cataract material in the front, but then the lens is actually burst open. And this little guy who lives with E. caniculi has a chronic problem with a really more severe head tilt and weakness issues. So if a rabbit comes in the hospital, how do we diagnose E. caniculi? There, unfortunately, is a lot of controversy behind the diagnosis of this particular disease because many of the signs that we can see look like other diseases. We often have to do a few different tests to say, okay, we really truly think that this is E. caniculi um, as our main problem. We may do blood testing. Blood testing is probably going to be the more helpful diagnostic that we have right now. There were some old blood tests that were not that great. The blood tests have changed in the last few years to where they are a little bit more helpful than what they once were before. So right now, that's the best test that we have. Of course, we may be suspicious for it based upon our physical exam findings, but again, we do need to rule out other diseases. So we may be asking for general blood work. We may be doing x-rays. Um, you know, it all just depends on what the signs are that that particular individual rabbit is presenting with. Now, again, there are complications that can arise from having E. caniculi, just like we were talking about with bladder sludge. Uh, when you have E. caniculi, problems that can occur, again, things like bladder sludge, frequent urinary tract infections can occur because if you have this organism and it's affecting the nervous system and causing things like hind end paresis, paralysis, they're not able to move those hind limbs as well, they may not be able to completely empty their bladder out as well. If they're not able to completely empty their bladder out, they may again have sludge accumulate or you may be more likely to developing urinary tract infections. Um, some rabbits may present with complications in the form of frequent bouts of gastric stasis syndrome. Gastric stasis syndrome is caused by a lot of different things. And of course, nerves are very important in the functioning of that gastrointestinal tract, stimulating normal motility of the intestines. So if we have something that's in affecting the nervous system, it certainly leads one to believe that it could potentially affect how the gastrointestinal nervous system is working and could potentially result in us seeing signs of chronic or reoccurrent gastric stasis syndrome as a problem or complication from E. caniculi. Um, other things that we will see is bladder scald, or it's not bladder scald, excuse me, urine scald from, from E. caniculi because they're not able to move around as well with hind end weakness, because they're having issues with emptying out their urinary bladder, they may urinate on themselves, not be able to get away from it very well, and rabbit skin is extremely deli delicate. Compared to like any other animal skin I've ever touched, rabbit skin is like the most delicate stuff, and so it's very easy for them to get things like urine scald. Um, and then lastly, I put out their muscle atrophy. So the muscles basically of those hind limbs, since they're not being used as much, the muscles are going to kind of waste a little bit, so they're going to be a lot more thin in those muscles in the back. Okay, so for treatments, um, the most common treatment that is used for E. caniculi is a product called Fenbendazole. The brand name is called Panicure. So Panicure, Fenbendazole, they're interchangeable. Another drug that's used is called Albendazole. Both of those work in very similar fashions. Um, there are controversies associated with those particular medications. In particular, fembendazole 
there are certain rabbits who do have a sensitivity to it. And unfortunately, we don't have a good way to identify which rabbits are going to be sensitive to it. What it can do as a side effect, that particular medication, is it can cause suppression of the bone marrow. And in causing suppression of the bone marrow, your bone marrow is really important for producing your red blood cells, your white blood cells, your platelets. If we suppress that bone marrow, then a rabbit can become anemic, it can become immunocompromised because its white blood cells aren't functioning, and you can have a rabbit go into a fatal bone marrow suppression and die from something like fenbendazole. So it's not something that's without risk in and of itself. Now that tends to happen when a rabbit has been on it for somewhere right around 30 days. Um, so people have come up with different treatment schedules. Some people the classical way to do it is to do the medication for about four weeks, but because of the fact that there is a risk associated with it, some people will do it for a two-week time period and then give them rabbits a break, see how the rabbit's doing, see if we need to go back on it after a break. It's kind of variable, um, definitely something that you really need to be working closely with your veterinarian to determine how long that particular individual rabbit should be on the medication for. And if it is a rabbit who is on the medication for a longer period of time, because certainly I have known rabbits as well that have been on and then dissolve for really long periods of time. Those particular rabbits should be having red blood cell counts, white blood cell counts being checked um, to make sure that they're not having any complications from it. So a, a complete blood count is what it's called. It's just something that we should be doing as follow-up for those particular individuals to make sure that, okay, they're doing okay, we don't need to be worried about um, them having a toxicity from that particular medication. There are other medications that can be used out there. About like five years ago, I think this particular medication, Panazaril, it's also called Marquis, that came out on the market. And people were really hopeful that that particular medication would help with E. caniculi. It's something that, you know, I have used it before, but it, uh, it's not as helpful as I think everyone was hoping that it would be. So Fembendazole tends to be the most common one that we use. But there are other medications that you will be using in concurrency with your E. caniculi treatment, anti-inflammatories, because again, how that organism works is it's jumping from one cell to the next and bursting things open and causing a lot of inflammation. That inflammation can really be part of the problem with E. caniculi, and so anti-inflammatories helping take away a lot of that inflammation in those tissues can be helpful. Supportive care, of course, for things like stasis that can develop secondary is going to, might potentially be needed. If we have a rabbit that has a head tilt from E. caniculi, then how those rabbits feel is, like, if you guys have ever been on a boat all day and hanging out and having fun, and then you come on to land and you're kind of really like, oh my gosh, it's, I feel like everything's moving. That's how a rabbit feels, but the rabbit feels like that for quite a while, um, and I think some of them feel a lot more severe with it. Because some of these rabbits will even go from just a head tilt to actually rolling, circling, falling over, and can be very violent um, sort of behaviors that these guys can have. Of course, if we have a rabbit that's rolling around all the time because it's just so dizzy, we need to stop them from feeling dizzy. So sometimes we're putting them on medications that take away that kind of dizzy feeling that they may have. If a rabbit is acting really dizzy, not eating a lot, then there's the thought that they could potentially be nauseous, so some of the anti-nausea meds that people will take um, for being on a boat and feeling nauseous, we can prescribe those things for rabbits as well. And then, um, you know, I also just sort of put up here, again, that that treatment length is controversial, that it really is something that you do need to be talking to your individual veterinarian about that particular rabbit to know what medications is best for that particular individual, what do we need to be doing for treating any secondary problems um, that can come about from it. So, Okay, so follow-up for E. caniculi. So despite the fact that there are a, there's a lot of information about E. caniculi out there for rabbits, it's something that unfortunately we don't have all the answers for, and it's not something that we can really cure. Um, we don't know how to get rid of this disease completely, unfortunately. So some rabbits that come in with this sort of problem may only have a real problem from it once. Some rabbits that have a 
E-Caniculi will have bouts of it occur later on in the future. So we may get them through an initial episode, but later on down the road, they may have it occur again, another episode again, numerous times throughout their life. It could be a couple of weeks down the road, months down the road, or years down the road. Unfortunately, there's no way for us to be able to identify how long is it going to be that this particular rabbit is going to do well for, or if this rabbit is ever going to even have a problem from this again. Some rabbits that have this will have permanent damage from this problem, and some rabbits I have certainly known that have had a head tilt go on to have head tilts for the rest of their lives, and they do learn how to compensate with those head tilts, and do learn how to get around okay and navigate their environment. Of course, they need a little bit more of a handicapped environment, which again, we'll be talking about a little bit more at the next lecture series. Um, but, you know, it's something that they, they can still have quality of life with this particular disease. Um, and so, and then I just put a note at the bottom, again, that if we have a rabbit that's on some of these medications for longer periods of time, they may need follow-up blood work to make sure that they're not having any complications or problems from the medications.